everybody. Welcome, welcome to Worth Repeating Weeds. Uh, stories about pulling up the weeds in your life or marijuana. All right, we got some marijuana fans. <laughs> we'll be uh, confiscating it all as you leave. We're so excited, guys. They work so hard. I'm really excited to introduce the first storyteller of seven. Uh, that's going to be Natasha Gonzalez, guys. She's here to describe a time when it seemed like she was pulling up weed after weed to reach her goals. Please welcome to the stage Natasha Gonzalez, everybody. I've been a nurse for eight years. I remember sitting in the comfort of my home watching the TV in the winter of 2020. And I remember seeing my fellow nurses struggling, crying, upset, and thinking, I can't sit here and watch this. I can't sit here knowing that I can help. So I made a phone call, probably one of the biggest phone calls I've ever made in my life. And the day after Easter, I was in New York City. I remember being in the hospital on the unit, working 15 hour days, seven days a week, covered in PPE, sweating like I've never sweated in my life, and not being able to see anybody other than the eyes. There was nothing distinctive about who anybody was. There was no colored uniforms. There was no badges. It was just everyone covered in head to toe PPE. And I remember sitting there, sorry, standing there and having this moment of just confusion and thinking, what am I doing? And the charge nurse saying, Natasha, go take a break. You need a break. And I remember going downstairs, sitting in the atrium of this hospital with this cup of coffee in my hand. I didn't even have the energy to drink it. I cried into it. Um, and I thought, this is definitely a low. <laughs> Wondering, what am I doing? Feeling helpless, hopeless. And looking around and thinking, I can't be the only one. And looking into everybody's eyes around me, realizing I wasn't the only one. And that everyone's mental health was affected. I'd always wanted to pursue my doctorate degree. And in that moment, that solidified that I didn't want to be an acute care nurse practitioner. I wanted to be a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner because I wasn't the only one being affected mentally. And I knew that so many people around me were and they would need help. So I applied to a local graduate program. I remember being in my home tell weeks into my assignment with my friends who had become family at that point. And I got an email. Congratulations, you've been accepted into your doctorate of nursing practice program. And I cried happy tears because who wouldn't? This is my dream and I was going to be able to help people. Fast forward to two years into my program this summer. What was supposed to be a hot girl summer quickly turned into a sad girl summer because I have to do a doctorate program project in order to graduate. If I don't complete this project, I don't graduate. I had worked and put blood, sweat, and tears into this project and received no after no after no. And I just was so confused. I'm sitting in my bathtub, naked, <laughs> crying inconsolably, listening to breakup songs like somebody had just shattered my heart. Again, feeling hopeless and helpless and struggling with imposter syndrome struggling with juggling everything that I had, businesses, kids, being a friend, being a wife, didactic, this project, everything was just spinning and just feeling very much in the weeds at that point. So I thought to myself, this isn't it. I'm going to do this. I have to do this. So fast forward to last week. And after months of putting together data for my new project, because I had to start over, by the way, 
and more blood, sweat, and tears of gathering data. I'm sitting in front of this local physician with sweaty palms, just as they are right now, a racing heart, just like it is right now, and praying to God that the physician that I'm speaking to is going to agree to my project so I can move forward, so I can graduate, and so I can start to help people around me. And what I feel is like hours have gone by and I'm rambling this data to her. And I look at her and she puts her hand on my shoulder and she says, this is amazing, let's do it. And I think that was the first time I was able to breathe. I remember walking to my car with a huge smile on my face, happy tears welling in my eyes. And um, I get in the car and I let out this squeal. <laughs> and I think to myself, I'm doing it. Of course, I'm in the weeds of this program, of this project. And I might forever be in the weeds because this is the life I chose. Just to stay busy, be busy, but I'm doing it. I'm going to make my children proud. I'm going to make my ancestors proud. I'm going to be a Latina with a doctorate degree. And thinking back on the good times and the bad times in New York, thinking on the good times and the bad times of this summer, and sometimes it's just part of what being in the weeds is, but I'm doing it. Thanks. Dang. I, I wish I knew what it was like. Oh, there we are. I wish I knew what it was like to like, Really work hard and get something great. I wish you knew that too. Like that was just what I was thinking. I was like, damn, I wish Dallas. But you know, because all the weeds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe you could get a doctorate in uh, marijuana. Not gonna happen. All right. Uh, well, underachiever. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good job. Clap it up one more time for her. All right. Our next storyteller is John Ramos. John shares a story about a couple of close calls and how hard it was to eat on the run. Guys, put your hands together for John Ramos. How's it going? How's it going? I got a story. It's a, it's a two-part story. Uh, it both happened within five days. Uh, it's pretty hectic, but then it's not. Uh, anyways, one day, me and my brother, we were on the phone one day. Uh, I, was at, I was at the house. I live in uh, Alizanis at that time in the west side. I don't know if y'all know. It's not the best neighborhood to be in. So uh, at night, it's pretty boring. You know what I mean? So anyways, we were on the phone and he calls me. He said, hey, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, I'm just chilling, not doing nothing. You know what I mean? So he was, oh, I got some weed. I got a dime. Let's go smoke. Shit. Why not? Let's go. Let's do it. You know what I mean? So he comes to pick me up. Him and his cousin Raymond. Uh, Raymond's like three years older than us, but he looks 10 years older than us. You know what I mean? So anyways, he picks us up in the truck and... Like any teenagers, we're out driving, driving around, smoking, doing dumb shit that, you know, teenagers would do. So we're at Woodline, <laughs> driving around. I don't know what the hell we're doing at Woodline. We're in the area. Anyways, we're just doing that. So uh, <laughs> so we're driving around the block. And anyways, uh, we're coming, uh, we're neighborhoods. And uh, I don't know, we just hear a cop, boop, boop. Oh, shit. Turn back. And uh, I'm in the middle, of course. I'm in the back seat. I'm scrub. I'm in the middle of, you know, my head's peeking up. So I look like a scrub, right? So anyways, uh. Anyways, I told him, oh, shit, what's going on? You know, the cops are coming. My brother had the weed. Like, Give me the weed. So, I, so I, I get the sack of weed. I was confident. I grabbed the bag, put it in my mouth, and not knowing what was going to happen. So half the damn bag fell in my mouth. The other half fell on my shirt and on my beard. You know what I mean? So I thought it was cool. So I, I dusted off my shirt. And uh, I'm just, you know, I'm, oh, shit, it's all good. Shit, not knowing that after a few seconds, the weed started drying my mouth. It's just drier than a Popeye's biscuit. You ever had a Popeye's biscuit? It's, just, it's horrible. So I'm there, I feel like an idiot, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm about to go to jail for some dumb, you know what I mean, I'm for weed. So I was like, oh, so the cop pulls up to the car, and uh, you know, he's, I guess he's ex-military or something, because he's looking at me with a flashlight, and he's giving me this funny look, he's just all pissed off, you know what I mean? So, and then he tells me, don't you know that's gonna get you sick, sir? I'm just a, you know what I mean? And then, <laughs> so he's like, get out the car. So I get out the car, it makes me spit it out. So I spit it out, you know what I mean? He's like, stop on it and stop on it. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to jail. And this guy, you know, typical traffic stop. He's asking questions. He's like, man, you're a dumbass. And 
you're you're an idiot. What are you doing here? You know what I mean? And then he starts going through my pockets and he's asking for a form of identification, which happens to be my school ID. So and he was like, oh, you know, and so he had a field day. He was like, this guy's a college student. He was like, I'm about to take this guy to jail and ruin his life. So I thought he was going to ruin my life. And um, anyways, he's calling me an idiot, calling me a dumbass at least 50 times, uh, asking why I was chilling with my brother. Dumb, everybody was a dumbass that day. My, my brother's his cousin. And uh, so anyways, he's telling me stuff and uh, he turned me around. So I figured, oh, he's going to arrest me. So I started going to the cop car. I'm walking and he pulls me by the handcuffs. You know, if you ever get yanked by handcuffs or any teep, it hurts. You know what I mean? So you're like, oh, shit. So I stopped and he starts uncuffing me. So I'm like, oh, what's, I guess he's taking me without cuffs. He turns around. He's like, hey, dumbass. Uh, here's your school ID. Take your school ID. Leave. Don't come back. So, so okay, we get in the car. And we split. We're driving this time. You know, so going fast forward, five days, me and my brother decide to go for more weed. This time we're walking. <laughs> the first time was, was 10 bucks. So this time it was $20. So just imagine uh, it half and half. It was a little bit more. So me and him had enough for our own Popeye's biscuit. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we're walking. And turns out we're in the middle of the damn Alazanas again. You know what I mean? So we're in the damn park. I don't know why the hell. We're in the park, you know, two grown ass men in the park. So, uh, so anyways, cop pulls over and, uh, yeah, so he pulls us over and, uh, he, one cop, you know what I mean? And then out of nowhere, three cops come. And then by the time you know it, there's six cops there and we're like, holy shit, they're going to beat us up. You know what I mean? And, uh, well, they didn't beat us up, but, uh, the cops, cop has my brother in the back seat, and, uh, you know, I thought he was going to jail. He's looking at me. He looks like a puppy in the back seat. I thought he was going to, you know what I mean? He's all, and I was like, man, shit, dude. And, uh, so, Anyways, we're there. Cops are messing with us, asking us questions. Another cop comes up to us and he says, man, we're going to make y'all a deal. So I'm going to split this bag in half. If you eat half and you eat half, since y'all love to eat uh, love to eat weed, I'll let y'all go. So me and my brother look at each other. We're like, holy shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I uh, shit you not. We're like, that. okay, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, so anyways, like the cops about to tear, tear it in half. And then I don't know where another cop comes and he says, words out of his mouth. He's like, don't y'all do that dumb shit. And he's like, y'all know better than that and this and that. And he starts going off on the cops. Me and Mike were like looking at each other. It's my brother Mike in the front. But uh, uh, yeah, so anyways, we're looking at each other. <laughs> Why sit down? <laughs> anyways, we're looking at each other and uh, we, we, we just, you know what I mean? We're like, holy shit, we're going to, you know what I mean? What the hell's going on? And then the cop told us, y'all are both. Lucky, there's a bomb threat at the magistrate. He's like, well, I'll lock y'all's asses up. And I was like, bro, no, you're lucky it's a bomb threat. But <laughs> anyways, like a lot of people like to uh, take this as funny and stuff like that. But I, I took it another way. Uh, what if the stakes were different? What if me and my brother had drugs on us? What if our skin color was different? The consequences would have would have been different. Just anything. And with everything going on in the world today, it just it felt good knowing that there was one cop there wanting to step in and change the dynamic of the situation and kind of get us out of there and let us go along with the first two cops. So I guess, like I said, the first half is funny. Second half tells a different story. Changed the whole dynamic of everything. And uh, I guess, like I said, man, it gives us another another uh opportunity to keep going and shit me my brother didn't have to eat a damn quote-unquote Popeye's biscuit so we would have been there looking stupid at each other <laughs> so that's pretty much what it is I mean it, it was it was a scary day that day at that moment because you know when you think about you know you just you just funny now because you know you're just like holy man what, what could have happened but I mean when, when you're really looking back at it now uh it's crazy so that's when we were driving so a third time we decided to fly, but uh, nah, nah, it's not it. But uh, it, it was what's funny is uh, I also have a brother, and we used to smoke, and I, I always tell my brother Mike, and I was like, damn dude, can you imagine if we had my brother Kevin with us? We would have been sh like it would have been worse. So my brother Kevin, he used to smoke weed, and for some reason, he looked stupid, and his hair would stick up like alfalfa, and he was Mexican, so. I mean, shoot, we call him Alfada or, or something like that, you know what I mean? But that's pretty much what it is. I'm just glad we went with him because, he, like I said, he looked stupid. He would have definitely gave us away, with, especially with his hair sticking up like he was Alfada or something like that. But y'all have a good one. <laughs>
Nice. Now, now that's a story I can relate to. Yeah, getting arrested? Yeah, the first one, I was like, man, I wonder what that's like. The second one, yeah, I've been there. That's. <laughs> yeah, sounds scary. Give it up for the brother right here. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I guess so you've been detained or arrested all the way. All the way arrested? Yeah, well, you had the biscuit? Yeah. I, and that's the other thing. Great, great. Th that biscuit uh, analogy is perfect. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Here's the thing is that the cop knew it's like betting someone can't drink a gallon of milk. He knew they couldn't eat the weed. It's yeah, not going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. You need to bake it first, right? Yeah. Like, make I, butter. I don't know anything about that. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Our next storyteller is Winston Dean. Winston is going to share a coveted ritual in the rabbit holes that follow. Please welcome to the stage, Winston Dean, everybody. So, to start off, um, me and my family, we recently got Ancestry.com to find out a little bit more about our heritage. We don't know much about it. I'm not going to go into details as to why. Um, but uh, the results came back. Turns out we're roughly 30% sativa. So... <laughs> Okay, I was honestly like, I knew that would go well with this crowd. We're here for weeds. Guys, I've told that that's that whole entire story like to Odessa, and Odessa, Texas, totally different vibe. Um, it's not clear eyes and full hearts, it's blank stares and angry faces. And I know the blank stares are like, uh, Sativa, is that a tribe in Africa? And I wanna be like, yes, Sativa's and Indica's been at war for centuries, guys. Um, so that's me alluding to the fact that I smoke so much that I consider it a part of my DNA on some level. Um, I have a lot of friends that enjoy smoking. I live in Austin, Texas, but, um, sometimes they'll ask me to do things with them that just make no sense to me. They'll be like, Hey, uh, Winston, let's go to Zilker park and get high, man. And I'm like, let's get high here and then go to Zilker park. Like, what are you talking about guys? I'm black. I'm not trying to get cut out here with green. I'm sorry. It's just... I'm good. Um, but uh, one thing I really enjoy doing is getting lost in the weeds with random facts. If anyone knows me, they know that I love random facts. One of my favorite shows of all time is Jeopardy. Are there any Jeopardy heads in here? I love Jeopardy, guys. And Jeopardy right now is having a tournament of champions where there's people there that have won as many as 40 games in a row. It's, it's, it's so cool. And I'm going to go over some of these random facts that I've learned while being high watching Jeopardy with you guys, if that's cool with you. So to start, first question, or I guess first response was, this military strategist played a major role in the invention of Braille. Ding, Napoleon Bonaparte. Crazy, right? You hear that fact and it's like, what? Braille was not invented for blind people, but it was invented for war? And it's like, yes, Napoleon told his soldiers, if you can find a form of writing that we can use at night and the enemy won't spot our location, I'll give you a substantial raise. And that was the beginning of Braille as we know it. Right? Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. Random, random facts. <laughs> People, guys, don't sleep on these random facts, okay? But whenever I hear that fact, I'm like, I think personally, when I heard that fact, I was like, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that all the way until Napoleon, there wasn't one person in human history to be like, Maybe we should teach these blind people to read, you know? It's like, no, fuck them. They'll, they're doing fine. They're lucky to be here, okay? Um, some people lock up when I say that, but like, guys, I promise you, being blind is a lot like being black. It's only gotten better the closer to now that we've gotten, okay? It's just facts. Um, moving on, second fact that I want to tell you guys about. The, question, the, the response was, this team in 1966 won the national championship with five star black players, five starting black players. Ding, Texas Western. I don't know if you guys knew that fact, but in 1966, Te Texas Western won the national championship with five starting black basketball players for the first time in the history of college basketball. Pretty cool, right? It was also the first time it was ever attempted, guys. We are that much better than you at basketball. Like. <laughs> Not me personally, I'm a solid second pick, guys. If you pick me first, you will be disappointed, okay? I know I'm six foot three and black, pick me second, okay? <laughs> Just trust me on that. But uh, a lot of people know that random fact or are familiar with that random fact, but they don't know this random fact. After seeing this on Jeopardy, I thought it was really cool, so I started going down the rabbit hole, looking on Wikipedia. Did you guys know that from 1967 until 1971, 
they made it illegal to dunk in college basketball. It's like they saw that national championship and they were like, fuck that shit. Like, <laughs> Kansas will never get another title again. We can't have this, okay? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but I was sitting there thinking, maybe I'm just over here assuming that Texas Western was out here dunking the ball. Maybe they weren't. And then I looked up an article and the best player's nickname was Daddy Mac. So <laughs> he was dunking the basketball, needless to say. Um, but I don't know, also, going down this rabbit hole, I don't know if you guys knew this. If you're familiar with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he came out with the greatest shot of all time, the most unstoppable shot, the sky hook. It's impossible to block because he's taller than you, and the way you get to it, his shoulder's in the way, he's good to go. Did you know that he played college basketball from 67 to 1970 in those years where he wasn't allowed to dunk? So again, another story in black excellence, people. Give it up for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. All right. Okay, guys, so two facts down, one fact to go. And this one really stuck with me, and it was really confusing me as to why it stuck with me. But then the more I thought about it, the more it really made sense. So the, the response was, this animal has been killing great white sharks off the coast of South Africa. Ding, orca whales. Correct. And I was like, what the fuck? Are you kidding? Orca whales? are killing great white sharks. And I don't know why this fact was sticking with me so much, but then I began to, the more I thought about it, the more I realized it's all about perception and PR. First off, think to yourselves, guys, think to yourselves. Hear me out, hear me out, think to yourselves. We're gonna have a thought experiment. What's the first movie you think about when it comes to great white sharks? Exactly, it's coming up on you. Jaws, the shallow, the deep, they're dangerous. They're everywhere. What's the first movie you think about when it comes to orca whales? <laughs> Look, people, all I'm saying is these orca whales, I, I had to go, I had to look further. I had to look further. So I look into an article, and the same article I'm reading, they're talking about how great white sharks are avoiding the South African coast because they keep on getting killed by orca whales. So first off, Dangerous, the deep, the shallow, Jaws. What does that sound like description-wise to you? Super predator, right? And who was described like that in the 1990s? Us, black men, all right? Now, hear me out. Same article, like I said, they're avoiding the coast. What does that also sound like to you? At least to me, sounds like black mothers telling their black kids, don't go over there, there's a lot of cops over there, okay? And if I were to ask you to think for just a quick second, out of any fish in the ocean, which one looks the most like a cop? Let's be honest. Okay, I'm pretty sure, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure orca whales would say some shit like these colors don't swim, okay? I can't prove it, but I know it, okay? So just, you know, don't ever assume anything just off of the first impression, okay, guys? And um, next time you're in Austin, if you wanna hang out and you wanna smoke, we're gonna do it at my place, okay? And we're gonna watch Jeopardy. Y'all have been great, thank you. I think we needed to be high to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I learned a lot of things. I know, right. I want to play Jeopardy now. Yeah, I've actually I've actually been high enough to go down that same killer whale rabbit hole. You same know? thing with racism? Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, wow. you, you, you know guys how must they, have been smoking the same stuff. Yeah, they they only eat the livers of the of the great whites and then they let them die. Oh, whiskey drinkers sounds yeah, like. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, Jeopardy. Wow. Our next storyteller is Mariana C. De Leon Ovial. Ovalle, sorry. Yeah, I almost, I almost got it right. Mariana shares a story about how the love of the devil's lettuce became God's salad. Please welcome Mariana. Right. Okay, so. Who here has been high at church? There we go. Who here has been high at church? while sitting on a giant pair of lips. Hold on, let me explain. So three years ago, I decided to visit Denver for the first time ever. My husband and I went together and we decided obviously we were gonna do something weed related. Went in Rome, obviously. That's one of the big reasons we went. And so I go on to my420tours.com. I really recommend that website, by the way. They really take care of you. <laughs> Trust me. Anyway, so 
I go on there and I'm trying to pick an experience. I only have one weekend. And I see that they offer a, an experience of psych, a psychedelic laser experience at the International House of uh, Cannabis. And I'd never heard of it before. And so I said, fuck it, of course. We signed up for that. And the really awesome thing about this is that you actually can't. So you can't smoke in public places over there. And my 420 Tours is aware of this. So they pick you up in a party bus. They take, you, they take you to a dispensary, you get what you need, and then you get on the party bus and make your way to the church. And that's what we did. And so once I'm on the bus, I am sitting next to this Italian man from Chicago who looked a lot like Joe Pesci. <laughs> <laughs> this couple from Houston. And they're telling me about how they love visiting for the fact that they get to just enjoy this. And I wasn't expecting to bond so much, but I mean, I don't know what else I was expecting. So two pre-rolls in, we are pulling into this neighborhood and just picture, this is a church that was built in the early 1900s, a Lutheran church. And now it is this very special place. And you, don't, you can't really tell from the outside until you get closer. And you see the lights, the coming through like the windows, or at least that's what I saw. And the windows had <laughs> the windows had this like psychedelic art on it. Now that I did not imagine because I went back and checked. It, it's there. And so I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be a perfect place. We go in there, and the first thing that I see is a sign that says, smoke weed every day on top of the piano. And I was like, okay. I remember I visibly relaxed and I just felt comfortable with all the eclectic art and all the eccentric furniture. And that's when I see this big, beautiful, giant mouth couch. And it's when I'm perched on top of that mouth couch that I learned that it was donated along with all the other furniture by former professional athlete, Sean White, who is a very passionate member. And that's when I learned you can be a member. And I was like, you can be a member, what? And they're like, yeah, yeah, um, they're the only ones that get to smoke in the sanctuary. And I was like, you can smoke in the sanctuary. And I wasn't allowed to like, no, only the members. That's when I realized this is an actual functioning church, like a real thing. And they, they practice in the religion of elevationism. And I, at this point, I had just moved back to San Antonio from living in San Diego for a couple of years. So my perspective had changed a lot about weed. <laughs> and so... Just because it did change, that doesn't mean that I hadn't let go of all of this stuff I was carrying, this negative stereotyping about it, the, the, the trauma that I kind of had endured from growing up in environments that weren't supportive of that. And I still carried that. So when we pull up to this church in this neighborhood, I'm surprised because it's in a middle of Denver suburban, like not a school wasn't far from it. I wasn't expecting it to be this like, this is a serious space. We're opening our doors for you to come in and see this beautiful light, but this is a church, respect it. And so I'm sitting there in the pew, laying down actually now, because they're like, you can lay down if you feel, they weren't even done saying it, and I was already laying down. <laughs> and so <laughs> the lights go down and the laser light, the laser start going and the music starts and Alice starts falling down the hole on the wall. I see it, like, I didn't imagine that, <laughs> I promise. I think. Anyway, so I was like, I guess I'm going right down with her because in that moment, I was transported back to being 16 years old and being aggressively recruited into campus life at my school because I was hungry for community and spirituality. And it took me back to being 17 years old and having to smoke before going with my friends to the youth group night because I felt so massively uncomfortable in that space without it. It took me back to being 19 and becoming a mother and having all this shame and having all this fear and clinging to rules. And the reason why it took me back is because we're listening to Pink Floyd and all I can think is secular music in the sanctuary. Now, mind you, I'm high at church, but apparently I draw the line at secular music in the sanctuary. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was just like, what? where did that come from? It's funny how indoctrination comes out in ways you don't expect. And in that moment, that's what came out. And I just remember 
thinking like I'm sitting here connecting with all these people and I start to realize, you know, when I was in the church, I, 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 I got defensive a bit, actually. I was like, you know, it wasn't always bad. Why are you, you know, acting like this? And then I'm like thinking, because in the church, I was told if you smoke weed, it'll isolate you from your, from your friends. It'll alienate you from your sense of self. You'll hate yourself. And then I'm like, that day I started processing and forgiving myself for realizing that what I was deconstructing from, because at this point I was years into deconstructing from evangelical Christianity. I was years into this. So at this point, I start to forgive myself and realize that evangelical Christianity is what did that to me. All the things it said that we would do, they did it to me. And in that moment, I just, I was like, but you know, it wasn't all bad. As I said, there were times when I've, I had the church high is what I like to call it, which is when you go to like a retreat a mission trip, or what I like to call ACL for youth, Christian youth, <laughs> which was acquire the fire. Those were the moments when I had the church high, and that's because I was with other people, surrounded with other people, and that's when I realized that was what it was all along. It was the people. The people were what made me connected, and then I realized that not there is no one answer. That's when I started to realize there's no one answer, and that was liberating. I started to realize that Nobody owns spirituality. That is a personal experience that nobody can claim. It is yours and yours alone. And I also realized, okay, this is what Jesus would do. <laughs> and that's all because I sat on a big mouth couch. Thank you. Wow, that was great. Yeah, Jesus wants us all to get high together. Let's gather around. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like weeds should be mandatory in church. Yeah, like I if think, you is it not? No, definitely uh, should. If you, if I was high and you were like, and then he got two of every animal in the world and put them on one boat, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You need one of each. Yeah, exactly. He needs a friend, bro. Have you ever been in Denver? I have. You have? Have you been to the, the church, the no, high church? No, 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 no. Yeah, I saw you couldn't smoke in there, and I was like, mm, not my God. <laughs> no, I went to Denver. I walked into a dispensary and saw they had weed soda, and I was like, this is too much. I'm leaving. And yeah, I yeah. Got on a plane, um, came home. Yeah. With the soda? No, no, just I was scared. Oh, okay. Mm. Straight to jail. All right. <laughs> oh, that was the first half of our show. Give it up for all the storytellers. Let's see. Our next storyteller is Elizabeth Sosa Bailey. Elizabeth's gonna share a story about an unlikely shaming and some pretzels that had a special kick. Please welcome to the stage, Elizabeth Sosa Bailey. My mom and I were with my dad when he got busted for weed. We were in the doctor's office, uh, pain specialist management at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. But it's weird, right? Because like my dad was a rebel. He's from, like he came of age in the 60s and the 70s. He would help, he was like Detroit Rock City, who's from this idyllic town, this like small town down river south of Detroit. And he knew Iggy Pop, he'd help Iggy Pop set up his music. He knew the MC5. I've even met some of the MC5, like he's like, he has been through a lot, right? He, he's a guy. He's a man who's done a lot of things. On top of all of that, um, he, he owned a bicycle store. He was what I always call like a renaissance man. He um, raced three series BMWs. He rode his Triumph motorcycles. He rode planes. Uh, and of course, he was a musician. So at the MD Anderson Cancer Center pain specialist doctor's office where his urine analysis had clocked him for being positive for THC, he was uh, actually, he wasn't just surprised that he hadn't ever been busted before, but, um, but he was also confused. Um, he had stage four non-small cell adenocarcinoma and also, as that was happening, he had had a blood clot that had dislodged in his left shoulder uh, that gave his left hand 
um, flesh necrosis, which is basically looks like frostbite. It's gangrene. Um, so stage four cancer, you know, but the thing was uh, his, his body was already trying to go. I can't imagine the kind of pain that he would have been in at that time. And to be um, given the kind of shaming embarrassment for maybe having THC was just wild to me. But of course I said, very defensive as usual, CBD's legal and you know there could be traces of THC. There may have been some other things. <sighs> Later, I'd remind him, you know, I thought you liked those capsules, the capsules that Danny made you um, from California. Uh, I, I was moving back from California. There, I, I brought back suitcases full of edibles and shit. There's like, um, there were these mu mustard pretzels that he really liked. And I was like, I thought you did okay with the indica tea and when you do have that far of a progressed uh, cancer, you know, I mean, the metastasis is in your brain. So that confusion was genuine. The, the conversations that we would have to have after about um, where it was coming from. The thing was, when you're that sick or when you're in that much pain, I know, I know we're in the state of Texas and uh, we were in 2018. But the thing that bothers me the most isn't just that he didn't have this opportunity to maybe find some relief after that, because of course, mm, MD Anderson Cancer Center would rather give you morphine and tramadol than let you try some holistic thing or whatever we could be, on top of him not finding that relief, um, it also kind of cut out this opportunity for he and I to be able to bond. Perhaps I was not the best teenager or whatever. Everyone can relate, some of y'all. Um, public radio audiences, whatever, who knows. <clears throat> I was always struggling with this, like, am I cool enough for my dad? Or, and, and not just that, it, like, am, the things that he taught me, like integrity and being responsible. Like, I had a really good job in California. I was a marketing director of a historic theater, much like the Aztec or the Majestic here. I was doing really well. I I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to come back home. I was sad about it. Um, and then, of course, there's guilt about being sad. And in the end, I I wish that I didn't hold that resentment. Um, but... I think that it's okay to be sad and just still think of mm, the powerful, wonderful man that he was. Like the kind, like my parents and I couldn't go anywhere without running into one of his clients or a friend or something like that. And so that's the kind of thing that I've inherited <laughs> usually. And that's where I'm at. It's been just over three years since we lost my dad. And I accept that that is how we try and help people, even if there's going to be something that kind of gets in the way. I, you know what? I, I think there should be a rule. You know what I mean? If you're at a certain stage in your life with some sickness, you should be given weed like... Give them all the give drugs. Give them all the drugs. 
Like if you're, yeah, give them all the, I am of that mind, yeah. especially in pain relief situations. Like, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Like I got my mom high <laughs> and she was in pain. She, it was the cutest moment of my life. Like she was like, Tori, I think I'm hungry. <laughs> Yeah. And she ate a lot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, no. That, my mom was going through pain. It was a divorce, but I still got her high and she <laughs> felt better. That counts. That counts. <laughs> I think that's when you need that soda. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's a little, a little, okay, never mind. We'll talk about recipes. If there, was, re if there was red wine infused weed, isn't there? Let's make it. All right. It. Business venture. Our next storyteller is Paige Pratt. Paige shares a time when a brownie went too far and how there are worse things than getting caught red-handed. Guys, put your hands together for Paige. This is a story about the first time I got high. So growing up, I was uh, a very good kid. I didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to do. I didn't sneak out. I didn't skip class. I wasn't having sex, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing drugs. I was an angel, uh, the preferred child uh, from any parent, in my opinion. Um, my mother, when she was growing up, was quite the wild child. I mean, she did things I've never even been in the same room as. Um, so whenever she found out she was pregnant with me, especially being a girl, she was so worried I was going to be a spinning image of her. And she parented as such. Uh, I was guilty of crazy things at the age of three. Um, she liked to do this thing where, you know, a lot of parents, they turn into officer mom or officer dad and they go fishing for crimes. And she did that to me a lot, too. Uh, you know, I'd come home from church group and she'd be like, you're drunk. And I'd be like, I'm drunk on Jesus, mom. <laughs> she didn't get it. She didn't. She didn't get me. That's fine. Uh <laughs> And I really had the best intentions. Um, so junior year of high school, I wasn't allowed to drive, shocker, because uh, I would be doing nonsense, you know. So I found a ride home from some friends of mine who did happen to be the biggest potheads in my high school. But they, uh, they'd they always ask me to smoke with them and say how fun it would be. And I'd get on my high horse and say, I'm never gonna smoke anything. And they took that very literally. Um, they called me one day and they said, hey, we're going to go see the movie Grandma's Boy. Would you like to come? I said, there's no way my mom's going to let me go, but let me check. So I go waiting for the smackdown and my mom looks at me and she says, you know, Paige, I've got a really bad feeling about this, but I never let you do anything. So just go ahead. Just come back when you're done. Don't go anywhere else. All right. Sure. So I get in the car and my friend Daniel pops out of the back seat with a heaping tray of very poorly made brownies. I mean, if you can imagine 16 year old boys making brownies, I'm pretty sure they put the weed in a grinder and then just sprinkled it <laughs> in the eggs. I'm not sure. And uh, the, the trouble here is that 16 year olds don't understand dosing. They don't understand that when you ingest marijuana it hits you 10 times harder than if you were to smoke it so naturally they had little old me have two brownies that were about three by four inches I would have been fine with one bite I was fine uh, until I was buying my movie ticket which is where I blacked out the first time when I came to it was about an hour later and I had none of my senses. I heard the ocean, um, just waves going, and I, f I found out it was actually people laughing. <laughs> and then my vision came back and I saw the screen and I saw the movie playing, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I really had no idea what was going on. I had no grip of reality. And uh, I don't know how I made it home. All I was thinking was, there's no way I'm gonna survive being high. And even if I do, the death of me will be my mother. So I somehow made it home. All I had to do was go tell her, I'm good. I walk in, you know, she would normally tell me I'm drunk and I walked in this time and she's just like, okay, sweetie, good night. So I, uh, you know, went back to my room 
in my victory of beating weed and my mom, I, for some reason, took a nude slumber. The only reason I uh, remember that or is notable is because the next morning I woke up at about 5 a.m. and felt a little queasy. And, you know, sometimes you feel sick and you just got to go get it out. So I was on my way to the bathroom. I did not make it. <laughs> and my stepdad woke up about two hours later to get my brothers up from school. And he found me face down, ass up, <laughs> out of it. And he says my name a couple times and I stand up give him a good head nod and just take a leisurely stroll back to my room. He runs back to my mom screaming, wake up, your daughter's on drugs. Which you think she'd be fine with, but apparently she's the only one who's allowed to accuse me of being on drugs. So now she's screaming at him. In the middle of her defending my honor, they hear the sound of 120 pounds hitting the floor across the house. I'm out again. This time I wake up about 20 minutes later. My mom's next to me. She's crying. I won't wake up. She gets me dressed, takes me to the emergency room. On the way there, she's calling everyone she's ever met in her entire life. <laughs> we found Paige on the floor. We don't know what's wrong with her. We're going to the hospital. We'll let you know. Prayers and thoughts. So we get there. They can tell something's wrong with me. I'm high out of my mind still. I was high for three days straight. So they see something's wrong. They, they stick an IV in me. And they say, you know, we're going to figure out what's wrong with her. We're going to start with a drug test. Well, I knew what was coming. But I'm high as hell. And I just say, nah, I've got no pee for you. He says, that's perfectly fine. We've got a catheter. We can hook up. I told him I thought I could find some pee. <laughs> so my mom's helping me uh, wobble my way into the bathroom so I don't eat it and break my teeth on the tile. So I'm sitting there trying not to pee on myself to pee into this cup. And my mom decides it's time to office her hat. She looks over, gives me a once over, and she goes, when did you start shaving that? <laughs> Who's that for? <laughs> Mom, now's not the time. Not the time. One crime at a time. So they come back and they say, we found very high levels of THC in her system. And my mom calls everyone back, tells them what happened, tells my friend's parents, my friends won't talk to me when I get back to school. It's first period on Friday, because I was high all week. Couldn't go to school. I finally get back to school, it's first period, and I tell everyone, you know, oh man, I got really high, I went to the hospital. It spread like wildfire, and by the time I had gotten to eighth period, no one had any idea that I had gotten high nor gone to the hospital. They just knew my stepdad saw me naked. <laughs> and as I was trying to find a lesson in all of this, to relay in this story, I was thinking, well, what is the difference here? The next time I tried drugs, I was 23. And when I told my mom about that one, she looked at me and she said, I know I should be disappointed, but can you get me some? <laughs> so my moral of the story is do the drugs your parents like, and they can't get mad at you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Paige's mom's party. <laughs> she does. <laughs> Ew. Uh, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. You made that weird. I wasn't going to make that. She was the only one that was no, naked yeah. in the story. Yeah, all right? Yeah. Um, that, is, that is, you know. That is a weird move to be like, I need no clothes. Yeah. Uh, she got high and she was like, I'm going to shed my earthly spirit. <laughs> wow. We've come to the last storyteller. Are you guys sad? Okay, well, settle down. Uh, <laughs> the headliner. Our last storyteller of the evening is Joshua Cabaza. Josh is going to share a story about the importance of wait time when making, yet again, an entire sheet of brownies. Please welcome to the stage, Joshua Cabaza, everybody. I quit smoking weed 
I still eat it. <laughs> but the reason I quit smoking is uh, the tolerance. Because you can smoke joint after joint after joint, and you're going to plateau. You're only going to get so high. But when you eat a heroic amount of marijuana, <laughs> God tells you <laughs> how high you get. God's just like, higher, <laughs> higher. Now that I think of it, it might have been Satan. <laughs> so Satan tells you how high you get. So this takes place uh, February 14th, 2005. It's burned in my brain. Valentine's Day with me and my ex-girlfriend. How fun. Yeah. We broke up two weeks before this. Correction. She broke up with me two weeks before this, and just like a lovely young lady, two days before Valentine's, I guess she didn't want to be alone. I was like, what was that thing you were planning? Maybe we should, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'd like a free meal and some gifts. That's not what she said, but that's what I hear now at 37. So I was like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I still have the reservations and all the stuff that I, I had nothing. I had nothing. I was in shambles and I, I, I mustered up everything I could and I was like, oh, it's gonna be the perfect date. It's gonna be, I'm gonna make everything perfect. Uh, but I, it's too late to make, you know, reservations. So I winged the whole thing. And uh, I went, I picked her up from her dorm, right? And I was just like, so what do we got planned? I was like, well, we're going to Sixth Street. Yeah, she thought we were going dancing. I don't know how to dance, so that wasn't it. Uh, I just took her to a restaurant called the Iron Cactus. <laughs> Not even a super nice restaurant. It's like an expensive Chili's. Is <laughs> is what it is. You don't need a reservation. You just walk in. In fact, we got there at seven p.m. and there's ten people there. But uh, I decided to sit at the bar because I thought it'd be, yeah, let's sit at the bar. We'll have margaritas. Because it's romantic. You're, you're, this guy already knows it. It's like, no, that's not. <laughs> you're messing it up. But it didn't matter if I messed it up because I had an ace in my back pocket, which was what? I made uh, the best weed brownies that any man or woman has ever made. It was a regular... H-E-B bag of brownies, right? But it had a quarter pound of marrow. And when I don't think like some really fluffy, nice stuff. I'm in college. I can't afford that. This is a brick that I got from my uncle <laughs> in the valley. And he told me all I can get you is a quarter pound. And I was like, all right. So even he thought I might be a narc. He's like, I don't want a felony. So I unwrap the whole saran wrap and I get a butcher knife and I cut up all, as much as like, you can't smoke this. This is unsmokable. And I put it in the pot with butter, but not sticks of butter. It was like the bucket of butter. <laughs> and I get the whole bucket of butter and I'm like, she's gonna fall in love with me, I know it. <laughs> This is a fall in love potion. That's what this is. Oh, this is going to be so good. We're going to go to the Iron Cactus. <laughs> so the date's going horrible. But I don't care because I tell her, I'm like, you ready for your big surprise? And she's like, finally. I was like, all right, well, we got to go back to San Marcos. Because like, we went to school at Texas State. And I was just like, why? I was like, because it's at my apartment. And she's like, ugh. Because she's automatically assuming it's either drugs or sex. It was both. I wanted to give her drugs <laughs> and then have sex. We were both going to be on drugs, just so we, everybody's clear. <laughs> we're talking about the, I don't know why I put my hands up too. Like, hey, <laughs> I promise I'm a good person. And uh, my roommates and my friends had seen me make the brownies and uh, 
I know they wanted some, but I told him, I was like, you got to wait. You can't, I got to, she has to have the first one. Because I'm a gentleman. <laughs> so we get back to Comanche Hill. We're on the third floor. And we go all the way up and open the door. And there's a big blue couch that I have, a sectional. And there's eight dudes sitting on it. <laughs> and she walks in and they go, happy Valentine's. <laughs> She's like, uh. <laughs> And we go and we sit down. She's like, what's the surprise? And I take it out. I was like, it's brownies. And she's like, oh, my, really? That's your surprise? I was like, but it's weed brownies. I know you like weed. And she's like, give me the brownie. Just give me the brownie. <laughs> so we all sit. We eat a brownie. Uh, we'll watch uh, a classic, Waiting, with Ryan Reynolds. Young Ryan Reynolds. Beautiful man. And I can tell she's not having a good time because she still has her purse. <laughs> and I'm nervous. I'm like, come on, that's, I, I can't believe I messed this up. In my 20 year old mind, I'm thinking like, yo, this is the night and it's not going like I wanted at all. And so everybody's getting high and as we're watching the movie, I'm so nervous, I keep eating the brownies. Yeah, yeah. And the movie ends, and we're so high, I go, hey, let's watch it again. <laughs> and they were so high that they go, yeah. <laughs> so the second time into the movie, the whole batch of brownies starts hitting me hard. Like the world is spinning. Like hard, right? And I'm just trying to like, just be normal. But my hands are like this. Be normal. Be normal. And then it got too fast to where I felt like I was going to get flung off the earth. But I remember seeing this thing with these jet pilots, they put them in a centrifuge, and then they check the G-force on them, right? And the way they would breathe would <laughs> So I took my pilot training, <laughs> and I started going <laughs> Now all the other nine people, sitting on the same couch have only had one so they all look at me like what is wrong with him and i can't control it and my thought process is like i'm just too high up i need to get to lower altitude that's what it is just gonna get to lower altitude so i warm my way off the couch and i go to the ground the carpet just dirty college carpet and i'm on the just and they're staring at me like, what is wrong with him? And then I just start, uh, uh, and I couldn't handle it no more. And so I start telling him, get her out of here. Get her out of here. <laughs> but in my head, I was like, can you please take her home? <laughs> I'm having a time right now. Now my friend Bibles is a lightweight. And so when he saw that, he told me he thought I was turning into a monster. <laughs> so he tells her like, no, we gotta get out of here now, let's go. We gotta go, get your purse, it's already on, great, let's go. <laughs> so th they leave, my friends leave, they take her home, my roommates are super high, they go back to their rooms. They leave me on the floor as I'm shivering and I'm like, be that, be the pilot, be the pilot. And I start crawling, right, to my room. And I get in bed, and I start wrapping myself in my comforter, right? And it's one of those, the valley, the sheets, the big hole, the San Marcos. Well, I got mine in the valley, but yeah, they're from San Marcos. I got you. And I, I, I wrap myself in it, but I wrap myself too tight. And I start having a panic attack to the point where I pass out. I'm out for 14 hours. And I wake up the next day, 
missed all my classes, and I'm still high, like unbelievably high. And I look at my phone, and it's text message, text message, text, but it's blurry. And I was like, I can't, I can't do that right now. I can't do that right now. And I put it down. I'm high a whole other day after that. So we're talking, I calculate it was 36 hours total of being, which is not fun, which will definitely ruin your tolerance. Once I came down, not the next day, but the day after, I went to her dorm and I was gonna apologize. And I knock and another dude answers the door. And I, all I said to him was like, that's about right. That's about right. And I, I, I walked off and I, I learned a great lesson and I didn't, I quit weed for a year. It was just a year I quit weed. <laughs> I smoke weed now, but I'm an adult. My tolerance even back out. So I'm good. Anyway, I hope she's miserable. <laughs>